Hey, thanks for being here today. I hope you have already been uh, stirred in your heart by saying, you know what, when we get together as a congregation and we decide that there are certain things that we would like our kids to know, that we would like our, uh, our, our adults to know, um, and that there is a system by which we can learn some of these things, um, I want you to know that this, this pastor is very proud of the fact that there is pretty much an organized piece of education in the local church for every single age group, okay? Some of you came to adult Sabbath school today. Raise your hand, you get a gold star. Okay, very good. Now, some are involved in Pathfinders. Raise your hand, you get a gold star too, okay? Some might be in grades one through four. If you're in grades one through four, raise your hand. See, see? Now there's a club and a fun time parents. I'm really talking to the parents. I know that the kids raise their hands, but if the parents understand this, we would like to resurrect adventurers. There's pathfinders, but before pathfinders, there's adventurers, grades one through four. It is an incredible parent-driven organization that assists you in the doing of what we all hope as parents will happen, and that is that our kids will get to know God. So if you need a little help with that as a parent, we got you. We got you, okay? It's pretty cool. We are in a series, so if you come all of September, you will hear pieces of, we'll, we'll discuss pieces of what is known as the Lord's Prayer. Now, again, I'm going to let you know that my name for this piece of Scripture is not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. Because the disciples come to Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, they come to Jesus and they ask him, would you, rabbi, he's their teacher, he's their rabbi, would you, rabbi, teach us how to pray to God? You are, the, you are our leader, you are the one we want to follow, please teach us. So that's why I call it the disciples prayer because Jesus is teaching his disciples how to address God, how to think about God. If you want the prayer that I would consider to be the Lord's prayer, you need to go to John chapter 17. The book of John chapter 17 is where Jesus, the Lord, the God of the universe, prays for his disciples. That's him praying for his disciples. Matthew chapter 6 is him teaching his disciples how to pray to God. So it's a technical thing, you might say. We always call it the Lord's Prayer. We could say it's the, one, it's the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples to pray. And it begins with our Father. This is a quick review for a few seconds here. It begins with our Father. Our Father, we learned last week, is the householder. He's the one who is in charge of the house. Okay? Uh, it goes on to say, who art in heaven. This is the realm, if you like. This is the extent of the holdings that this householder has. So you're addressing our Father. You're, you're, you're saying, I have this relationship with you. You are the one who conceived me. You are the one who created me, and the, the thing that I'm saying to you is you are, I'm recognizing you as the, as the one who is in charge of the house. How big is the house? How, how wide is the house? Well, it's the heaven. His realm is the heaven. And then it says, hallowed. We learn that that's a nice old English word for uh, reverence, uh, uh, worship. Hallowed be the name. Be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Name we realized last Sabbath is a family name. 
So you know, uh, just, just quick, see if, see if you remember what we learned last Sabbath. If, if somebody you, you hear in your daily work or you're going around and somebody, somebody uses the name of Jesus in, in, in an in a, in a expletive, remember I, remember I said that there are certain words in English we like to say sometimes, we are taught that they're bad words, but... Uh, they, we like to say them, and I'll tell you that it's a physiological reason why we like to say them. Because when we say them, we express. Okay? And you know them. The S word, F word, you know. I mean, there's some people that are so creative with these words. You have to think about how they're using them because sometimes they can be like happy, sometimes they can be angry. Sometimes they can be sad, and they're using the same word. It's very creative. Sometimes I wonder whether they could just expand their vocabulary and they'd be better off. But they seem to want to use these words because they're able to express their emotions with these words. And so sometimes you'll hear somebody say, Jesus Christ! And you're thinking, oh, he shouldn't talk like that. Because it says in the commandments, you shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. We learned last week, my friends, that this idea that is in the third commandment of not taking the Lord's name in vain is more about marriage. When you decide to get married, you take a name, you become joined, you become associated with a family. And so, in some respects, when we pray and we ask for forgiveness, I'm coming to the more deep realization, even myself, that we should be praying, God, please forgive us for doing things that didn't look good for the family. Do you feel me on that? I know my dad instilled in me, when you do your work, do a Stevenson job. Have your parents ever said that to you? In other words, we have a reputation. Stevenson's have a reputation of doing a good job. Don't be sloppy, because that's not a Stevenson job. See how the name infers a reputation? And so you, you take this name, and the third commandment says, don't do it if you don't mean it. Don't do it if you're just going to go out and live whatever way you want because maybe whatever you do is not going to look good on that name. So I've gone to praying up front here saying, God, forgive us when we do things that make your name look bad, that make the family look bad. Does that help maybe with... Uh, a new definition for sin? Sin is those things that make God look bad. Isn't that why the devil wants us to do them? Because you see, his whole point, his whole mission in life is to make God look bad. And so by looking at the word name, we understand this is the family. What I do matters. Because it reflects on the family. So today, we know that we have, by saying these three parts, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy name, we have the opportunity every time we say this to renew our vows. We've, we've taken a vow. We've, we've, we've joined ourselves to to a God, and we're in relationship with Him. We could put on our Facebook, in a relationship. So when we say this prayer, we're renewing our vows to God. We're, we're also seeking His order. We're saying, you're the householder. You're the one in charge. And we're also seeking the advantage, looking for the advantage of the kingdom of God. So, today, you ready? We're going to get political. And you're saying, oh no. Religion and politics in the same day. This is not good. 
But you know, it's in the prayer, so I can't help it. Okay, it's in the prayer. We're going to get political because you see, Jesus arrived on planet Earth as an invasion. Have you ever thought of that? Do you wonder why he came in a stable at the back of the hotel in Bethlehem instead of in the palace? Because it was an invasion. And he needed to be able to be successful if he had come maybe as a frontal assault on the evil empire that had taken over this world. They would have met him at the gates and turned him away and he would not have been able to do his work. So he comes, God's plan, he comes quietly. He comes quietly unnoticed. And, and, and we get all upset at Christmas time because we read stories like, he came to his own and his own received him not. His own didn't even understand. His own weren't watching. Well, yeah, they were watching the palace. Oh, yeah, the Messiah, he's going to come, and he's going to be our king. He's going to be the son of David, and, 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 they, and he's probably going to be born in the palace. So when he comes in the stable, it's this covert operation. So understand that Jesus, when he arrives the first time, it's an invasion. You must understand it from the perspective of the evil empire. Back in the day, Lucifer had taken over from Adam. That's what happened in that moment when first Eve and then Adam gave over their position of rulership of this world, which had been given to them by God. They gave it over to Lucifer. Okay? When they decided to distrust God and believe Lucifer, they made him the king of this world. How do I know this? If you look in the beginning of the book of Job, the story is like this. Job, uh, it, it is before, before uh, he's, he's in the picture, God is seen in heaven with all the princes of all the worlds. And guess who is there just walking around like, like he owns the place? Having already been kicked out of heaven by this time. Well, it's Lucifer. And God doesn't go up to him with, a, with, with some kind of sword telling him to get out of heaven. He goes up to him and says, and um, where do you come from? In other words, what are your credentials for being in this meeting of the princes of the world? And Lucifer says, very bluntly, I come from walking to and fro upon the earth. It's my domain. So fair and square, want you to know, Adam gave away the planet. Adam and Eve. They gave away the planet. We know this because of that story in Job, which scholars tell us is the oldest, the oldest recorded history in the Bible. Jesus came to this earth, he invaded this earth to win it back. He says to Nicodemus, anyone remember Nicodemus? Remember the hoodie? Puts his hoodie up, meets Jesus covert at night because he doesn't want to be associated with this radical rabbi. And Jesus zings him and says, you know, Nicodemus, I have come. The Messiah has come for the whole world. We love the text, John 3, 16. But can you imagine Nicodemus hearing this and having Jesus actually say to him a few verses before, and you are the teacher of Israel. You are the guy who is supposed to know. And you don't know this? You don't know that this is the plan? There's going to be an invasion, and, and the invasion's going to come, and it's going to be so that, so that God can take back rulership of the world. God has to play by his own rules. So Jesus' plan to take back the world had to be done legally. I'm happy to report he did it. 
You can say amen, it's okay. <laughs> it, it, it simply means that there's a way of salvation for you and you don't have to be a hopeless uh, bunch of people today. Uh, it's okay, that's all right. So, say, thy kingdom come. When we say that phrase, when we say that phrase, we, we are saying this, this invasion that God has done into this world where he died, was buried, and as we learned in our Sabbath school lesson this morning, he was resurrected, and that he did this on his own. Okay, this is, this is a bit more R-rated piece of scripture for you, but it, 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 um, it conjures up a very, 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 very difficult moment to think about. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He has previously told his disciples that he, get this very clearly because his disciples forgot, he would lay down his life and he would take it up. Okay, so I want you to put out of your minds any information that may have told you that it was the Romans who killed Jesus. Put out of your minds that it was the Jews who killed Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, I will lay down my life and I will take it up. And my friends, it was only the life giver who could claim to do that. So if we go around saying, oh, you know, those Romans, those terrible Romans, they killed Jesus, or oh, those Jews, they didn't like him, and uh, he was one of their own, and he killed... Stop! Jesus came for all humanity, and as the creator God, he had the life-giving power in him. We believe he's 100% God, 100% man. He comes and he says, I, God, am going to lay down my life as a human here on this earth, and I, God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it back up again. Don't miss that. And here's why. Because Jesus is on the cross, and it's getting to be Sabbath. One of the more strange parts of this whole story where the uh, leaders of the church go, well, the leaders of, of, of the synagogue, the, the Sanhedrin, go to Pilate and say, you know what, it's kind of icky that we have these guys on the cross and it's going to be Sabbath. You know, can we, can we hurry up this execution? We want to take them down. And they weren't going to take them down until they were dead. Well, uh, and the, you know, I hope the kids aren't listening, but you die on the cross by suffocation. So what the Roman centurions would do would be to break the lower legs of the people on the cross so that they could no longer push themselves up to take a breath. And that would speed up your demise. You would suffocate in your own juices on the cross. So here comes the centurion. He breaks the legs of the first person that Jesus has been crucified with because he's got, a, he's got thieves on either side of him. Remember? They wanted to totally embarrass him. You ever wondered why they put that sign on his cross? Well, just a few days before, he'd ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey... And they'd all been saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. He's going to be the next king of Israel. Look at this guy. And they put their coats down. Remember that piece? Well, the Romans were watching too. And they basically put a sign on his cross. Oh, yeah, Jesus, uh, king of the Jews from Nazareth. Like anyone who thinks that they're going to be king of the Jews and not Caesar, this is what we're going to do to them. Jesus was a living signboard on that cross of what the Roman Empire was saying that they were going to do to anybody who crossed them. Pun intended. So here comes the centurion. He breaks the legs of the one guy. He comes to Jesus, and he's about to break his leg, and he looks up, and he says, he, Jesus looks like he's already dead. So Luke tells us that he grabbed his sword, excuse me, he grabbed his spear, and he stuck him in the side. And what does Luke says? What, what, what came out? Uh-huh. The centurion was surprised that he was already dead. What did Jesus say he would do? I will lay down my life. What happened on Sunday morning? Did anyone resurrect the God of the universe? No! 
The angel comes down and he says, thy father calls thee. And Jesus and his father are one. This is what we teach. And he, he comes out of the grave. He is the life giver. He is the one who resurrects himself. And he takes back what he had given to Adam. The rightful rulership of the earth. We teach that Jesus is like a second Adam. What do we mean by that? He is the rightful ruler, the king of the world. And he has been that, and he always was that, but he takes that title back again the moment he is resurrected from the grave. So, when you are busy saying the Lord's Prayer, and you come to this phrase that says, Thy kingdom come. You are making a political statement. Beware. There are forces in this world who still want to say, no way. He's not the ruler of the world. We don't serve him. So, as I said in Sabbath school today, be understood, uh, please understand that, that you could be thought of as a dangerous person because you are a Christian. Because you believe in a, in a God who has invaded this world and has taken rightful rulership back of this world. And that has said, I'm going to come again. I'm going to come again. And when I come... I'm going to cleanse the world again. I did it with water. I'll never do that again. But I'm going to cleanse it with fire. My goodness, there are people who say that if you believe that kind of a future for planet Earth, you are a dangerous person. Didn't think that you'd come to church and be called a dangerous person, did you? But that's what the Bible teaches, and we tend to want to believe what the Bible says. Thy kingdom come is to say, Hail, King Jesus, Lord of the universe. To say this now is, and always has been, antagonistic. I don't know if you are feeling what I'm telling you. That's why I told you this part of the prayer is particularly political. And I'm talking about the politics of the whole world. Thy kingdom come. He is God. He is Lord. I am not. When Satan impersonated a snake, and tempted Eve, what was his temptation? Don't believe him. You will not surely die. He just doesn't want you to be a god like him. Your eyes will be opened and you will be as God. That's what it says. So my friends, when you say, thy kingdom come, you are admitting that he is God, you are not. We <laughs> have lived long enough, we are living in an age when I'm telling you, the entire culture is bent on teaching us that we are our own God. We can make up whatever rules we like. We can decide what's good and what's evil. It's amazing in this country of ours that our laws, when you look at them, are still based on the law of God. I believe that that's part of what's holding back the tide, the influence of evil in the world. I think the influence of America in many parts of the world based on a governance that is based on the law of God is what is helping to hold back the chaos that seems to be enveloping our entire world. Would you agree? 
I think it's one of the reasons I'm proud to be an American. When I, when I see America helping to do those kinds of things, helping to hold back the chaos that seems to be popular in many parts of the world, I'm, I'm happy for that. I'm happy for that when it happens in my town. Because as, as, as I've told you, Chris and I believe the crazy, the crazy is getting a hold of a lot of people. Yes, he was in his underwear on Highway 5 next to the Nazarene church. The sheriffs had shut down Highway 5 going south this week on Thursday. He tried to start a fire over there at the Nazarene church. And then, I don't know what else he was on, but he then goes up to the highway, starts taking off his clothes and walking in the midst of the highway. Now, we're not talking Africa. We're not talking India. We're not talking, you know, some other far-flung part of the world. We're talking Santa Clarita. And that's why Chris and I are just saying, you know what, the crazy is getting a hold of people. So when, when we, in a very spiritual, very worshipful way, say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Just understand, you are making a very, very political statement. You are saying, I am on the side of God in this controversy that exists in this world today. I am on the side. I want his kingdom to be expanding. I want his influence to be expanding. Thy kingdom come. Natural, natural outcome of this declaration is to say, thy will be done. May God, may your rulership be played out in our reality. May your reality, this is, this is what I promised at, at, at Sabbath school class, may the reality that God would like us to believe in and, and accept, may that reality be real for us in our world now. That's what you're saying when you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Guys, Time is up, but I'm going to say this one last thing. We have hope today because we are hoping, we are moving forward, we are spending our lives believing that what is happening on earth right now can be a part of what is happening in heaven. As it is in heaven, O oh God, may it so, may it be so here on earth. Now, if you don't have a Sabbath school lesson guide, please ask me. We'll buy some more if you need them. But this quarter, we're studying a phrase in Matthew 25 that says, the least of these. So if you need to know what it means to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. God, may this earth be part of your kingdom. We would like to help. We would like to press forward. We want to be part of your team to press forward that the way that it is in heaven would also be the way that it is on earth. The way that it is in heaven would also be the way that things happen in our community. And then you say to yourself, well, how do we do that? Well, I'll give you your homework for this afternoon. Go read Matthew chapter 25. That's what Jesus believes is important. That's what Jesus believes is going to help his kingdom to be here on this earth, not, in the, not just in the future, but now. My friends, we, <laughs> we need to live in the now. As Adventists, we have lived a lot in the past and the future. But we need to claim this prayer 
and say, God, may your kingdom be present now. May I be helpful to that kingdom. May the name that I have taken, the name of Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, may that be true in my thoughts, my actions, and my community. Amen.